I'm going to be talking at a rather high level of abstraction about economic evaluations, the most common method of economic evaluation, which is a two-step uh, procedure. Most economists working in practice to value um, policies, events um, in a country or across the world do it in two steps. The first thing they do is aggregate all the values that there are in the country of the world at each particular time to reach an overall value um, at the time. So they evaluate the, the world, say, in 2025, and also the world in 2026, and so on. So they arrive at a value at each time. And the second step is to aggregate those values across time to make uh, arrive at an overall um, valuation. And generally, most typically, when they're aggregating across time, they use they apply discounting. So they uh, often um, attach less importance to values that come later than to values that come earlier. That's the second step, but actually I'm going to concentrate on the first step of this two-step procedure. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the question of whether the world even has such a thing as a value at each time, with the property that together, if you take the value at this time and put it together with the values at other times, uh, those values together determine the overall value of the world or of the country. Um, that idea is called separability, strictly weak separability by times. Uh, the idea is that each world or the country has a value at each time, which can be added up with other values in order to arrive at the overall value of the, of the world or the country. That's separability, and I'm going to be talking about a problem that arises with uh, separability. And of course, if there is a problem with that, then there's going to be a greater problem with discounting because you can really only do discounting of the, of the normal sort if you have, in the first place, values at each time that, that you can discount. So this question is prior to the question of whether we should discount later times. I'll start with an example of this uh, difficulty. Um, here is a value that I think we mostly recognize. Uh, we think that in at least one respect in the last couple of centuries, the world has been getting better. And that respect is that it's been giving people longer lives. People get to live longer now than they used to a couple of hundred years ago. And we think actually that one is, that's one of the greatest benefits that economic development um, brings to us. However, that's not a benefit that we can readily recognize in this standard two-step procedure that I've described. So that's a serious problem. This important value doesn't fit into the two-step procedure, at any rate, without some extra work. And I'm going to describe why not, and then I'll talk about ways of getting around this difficulty. Um, and that will, it turns out, raise another interesting question which is how do we take account of the size of the population within economic valuations? That question turns out actually to be inseparable from issues to do with temporal separability and consequently with um, the discounting of the future. Now let me just pause for a moment because I'm slightly anxious about one thing. I don't seem to have the chat showing on my screen. And that's fine so long as the sound works all right. But um, if it doesn't, I don't think I've got any way of finding out whether it doesn't. Um, it's, it's all fine, John. Sorry? It's I all can't fine. Find the, the chat button is not available now I'm sharing my screen. But look, is that Andreas I just heard? Um, can you interrupt me if there's a problem with the sound? That's the only thing I'm worried about. Yes, we definitely will do. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, so right. far, everybody's well, saying they can hear you then. very and clearly. assume everything is going okay. All right. So 
Let me explain this difficulty of evaluating longevity, the increase in, in people's the value of the lengths of people's lives, um, and why that's a problem for separability. So first of all, let me remind you of a, of a well-recognized empirical fact about the increase in longevity. Um, it doesn't happen just by itself. There are further consequences. What happens in the course of what's called the demographic transition, which is when people get to live much longer lives, the first thing that happens is that the death rate declines. And then some decades later, the birth rate uh, declines. And in the meantime, the country's total population increases because people die less quickly before they start being born less quickly. So you end up with a bigger population. Now the value that I'm concentrating on, the value of longevity, is certainly not the value of the increase in population, whatever that may be, but the value of the increase in longevity. So in order to focus on that value, I'm going to deal with a very stylized version of the demographic transition in which I take away the consequent effect on the country's population. I'm going to fix it so that the population of the country remains uh, the same. This is what would happen if the death rate and the birth rate um, happened at the same time. So I'm going to compare a world before the transition with a world after the transition when the population, which is to say the population at each time, is the same. And to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that the level of, that the standard of living is not affected by this change. So as people get to live longer, they continue to live at the same, have lives of the same uh, quality. And then I can give you an illustration of this demographic transition in a sort of diagram. Here it is. So I've got two halves to this diagram, the one before the transition, the one after the transition, how the world is before, how it is after. Before, I've got, um, I've got time in, in, on, in the horizontal direction here and people in the vertical direction. Before the transition, I've got each person living for a couple of, of times. She, this one, for instance, gets born here, lives a life here, and then, then dies. So as you look across, each person lives for two years at standard W per year. Over here, after the transition, everybody is living for four years. So there's been this increase in longevity. And I've arranged it so that the population of every time in both cases is two people. Here, there are two people alive at every time. And over here, there are two people alive at every time too. So the increase in population has been canceled out. Um, and uh, it's, uh, but we've got everybody living uh, longer. Now, if we try to assess these two situations comparatively in a separable fashion, we won't get the right conclusion. Because if you look at um, the world before transition, time by time, separately, looking at one time um, at a time, at each time, you've got just two people living. Look along these vertical lines. You've got two people living, and they've each got a well-being of W. And that's exactly the same over here. At each time, you've got two people living, and they've both got a well-being of W. So if we assume that we can make the valuation of these worlds separately, time by time, we will have to think that they have the same value. But that's what we don't think, or we mostly don't think they have the same value. We think it's better to have people uh, living longer. Um, so a separable valuation misses the crucial point of the value of longevity. Um, we can define separability algebraically, and I've just put this here in case, you, in case you want to do it. To keep it simple, I was assuming that time is finite and the number of possible people is finite. And in that case, you, we can um, assume that the value of the world, V, is given by um, these Ws uh, um, for each person and for each time. There's a W11 here, which is um, W for the first person and the first time. This is W21, uh, which is for the second person and the first time. This is W12, which is for the first person and the second time. So these Ws are all the first person's ones. These are the second person's ones. I've, I talk of W 
because these things stand for the person's well-being at times when she's alive, but at times when she's not alive, W is um, uh, some sort of um, arbitrary, uh, is assigned some sort of arbitrary value which indicates that she doesn't exist. I generally write it as an omega when we're thinking, looking at a time when the particular person doesn't exist. So in practice, if things are going for a long time, there are going to be a lot of omegas in this vector here. Um, there's going to be omegas um, at all the times for each person when she doesn't exist. And there may be people who never exist at all in the particular world we're thinking about. Their lives will all be omega. But when they live, W is their well-being. So this vector um, captures both whether a person exists and how well off she is when she does exist. Um, and we will say that the value function, I've written value as a function of all these things. The value function is weakly separable by times, if, it, uh, if and only if it takes a particular form. And here is the form. This says there's a value of the world at the first time, which depends on everybody's Ws at that time, their well-beings or whether, and whether or not they exist. The value of the world at the second time, their well-beings and whether or not they exist and so on, right through to the last time. And if you can do the valuation by first valuing the times, that's the value of the first time, that's the value of the second time, and then putting them together in some way to get an overall valuation. That is the assumption of separability by times. And this is the function that in, in the um, first instance gives no value to longevity, as I just um, uh, explained. So now, uh, from now on, I'm going to drop this, um, this form, uh, this word weekly, Separability by times, by that I mean weak separability by times. Let me say a bit more about just what is this value of longevity that can't be registered by a separable function. There's certainly one feature of longevity that can be registered. Um, a separable function can register the extra well being that comes to a person if her life is extended. If a person gets to live longer than she otherwise would have done, then she'll go through a period of years. And during that period of years, extra period of years, she will have some well-being, and that well-being can be taken account of perfectly well in a separable function, because that extra well-being all takes place at some particular time, and therefore can be counted at that particular time in a separable uh, function. And um, so that value, the extra well-being a person gets, that is registered, can be registered in a separable function. But notice that you can get extra well-being in the world in two different ways. You can get it by extending the life of a person that we've already got, in which case it'll be registered in the separable function. Or you can get it in a very different way, which is to be by creating a new person who will live at later times and she will have well-being and that will be new well-being brought into the world and it will also be registered by a separable function. So those, uh, those two ways of adding well-being in a separable function are going to um, uh, have the same effect. They're going to be valued in the same way. But most people think intuitively that this second way of adding well-being to the world is less good than the first way. We think, most of us, we think, think that at any rate within limits, it's better to extend the lives of people that there are rather than create new lives, even if the people who live those new lives would be living all, getting all the same well being that the, um, uh, the people whose lives were extended would have had. Um, that means that in effect, we think that if you've got a given quantity of well being, to be enjoyed in the world. It's better to have that well-being divided among fewer lives. We prefer the well-being to be given to fewer people rather than having a profusion of people, each of whom has a smaller share of that well-being. And that value is the one that's not recognized in a separable um, uh, function. Um, a, a temporally separable value function can't recognize that sec second value that I've described 
So the value appears that appears when we think it's better to extend a life rather than to have a new person living uh, with the same amount of well-being. That value, which is what I should call the value of longevity simply, that value you can only identify when you're looking at one of these grids that I've illustrated already, when you're looking, looking, looking across times, so when you're comparing one time with another and looking in the grid to see whether the same person is alive at one time as at the other. And that's just the sort of thing that you can't do in a separable value function because it doesn't allow the sort of comparison between different times that, that, that that's involved. Um, so the two-step um, uh, procedure, which assumes separability of time, um, can't recognize this value, and it's therefore mistaken unless it can be fixed uh, somehow. Um, here's a note for economists. Um, I've been talking about separability of time of people's well-beings, whether or, and whether or not they exist, those Ws. As a matter of fact, economists, when they assume separability of times, are normally doing it for consumptions, what people are consuming at the different times, the material goods that they're consuming. And they often assume implicitly that consumption is separ separable by time. It would be just conceivable to have consumption separable by time, even if well-being was not separable by time. But although it's just conceivable, I can't think of any way in which that would really, really possibly have. So it's um, uh, virtually um, certain that separability of consumption by time implies separability of well-being by time. And that's why I'm concentrating on the separability of well-being. So here's a summary of what I've said so far. Um, temporal values are generally aggregated with a discount factor. The issue of separability is prior to the issue of discounting um, because discounting doesn't make sense without separability. But there is this serious difficulty with separability. It doesn't recognize the value of longevity. And that's a problem. And it's particularly going to be a problem for climate policies and other long-term policies, policies whose effects extend over a very long stretch of time because that's going to influence how long people live and also the development of the population of the world over those times. Um, and in the case of climate change, we know that one of the biggest harms it's going to do is to shorten people's lives. Climate change kills people, a lot of people. So at the moment we're stuck if we want to do discounting and we're stuck even if we um, are doubtful about uh, separability, unless we can find a way around this problem. Can we recognize the value of longevity within a separable function by some sort of a fix. And I'm now going to go on to fixes we might try. I've got one further note to make uh, about separability before we get to, to that. That is, there is another important value which a separable function can't recognize. And that's the value of equality between people's uh, lifetime well-beings. Look at these two um, grids here. Um, in the first one, we've got, as I said here, lifetime inequality. Again, I've got time on going horizontally, people going vertically. And in this diagram here, I've got alternate people, different sorts of people living alternately. Here, I've got a person living at level one for two, two periods. Here, a person living at level two for two periods. Here, one living at level one for two periods and so on. So this population is unequal um, in terms of the lifetime um, well-being of people. There are people with better lifetime well-being, um, people with less good lifetime well-being. Over here, there's no lifetime inequality. Everybody starts at level one and ends up at level two. But on the other hand, there is temporal inequality because it, at every time, there is an old person living at level two and a young person living at level one. So there's inequality between the old and the, la the young and that obtains at every time. So we've got temporal inequality here, but no lifetime inequality. Here we've got both. But look at the, um, make the comparison between these two time by time, looking at 
um, one, one period at a time. In every period here, you've got a person living at level one and a person living level at two. That's so here and it's so here. There's always a person at one level one and a person at level two. And that's exactly the same over here. There's always a person at level one and a person at level uh, two. So if we evaluate these two worlds um, separately, we're not going to be able to give more value to this one on the right than the one on the left. But that is intuitively incorrect because there is um, a sort of inequality over here which there is not over here. And this is an important sort of inequality, lifetime inequality. So that's a further objection to separability. It doesn't recognize the value of lifetime inequality. Uh, equality. So how, how are we going to, um, to fix these problems? Well, I'm going to concentrate on the longevity one and try out a couple of fixes to see how they work. Um, the first is one that I identify with Iwao Hirose. Um, he suggested um, that, that we should fix it uh, this way. We should recognize that when a person dies, she suffers a loss. She loses the rest of her life. And that's a loss that she suffers when she dies, uh, at the time of her death, um, that's to say. So we should subtract that loss from um, the value of the world for the person at the time when she dies. So now we can co co compare the worlds before transition and after transition, taking account of this loss which people uh, uh, suffer when they die. This is how Hiroshi recommends we do it. So let's take the before transition world where everybody lives for a couple of years at level W. Well, potentially it turns out because we could live for longer, potentially they're losing two years of life when they die. So this is a bad thing that happens to them. And Jerosi suggests we should take that badness off um, at the, the time that they, that they die. So the way we should value the world for, the, for this person at this time is her well-being at that time, but we take away the 2W because she then dies, and that's a bad thing. So this is a picture of the values that we should be putting together um, uh, at each time. Whereas if we, after the transition, this bad thing doesn't happen. People live for their full potential life of, of four years. So this is, this is how we should do the value according to Hirose. And you can see now that we can recognize by this means that this is a better world than this one because each, each, at each period, we value things separately, period by period. At each period, if we do it by addition, we get a value of zero here, whereas each period, if we do it by addition, we get a value of two W here. So this is the better world. That's the, that's the um, uh, idea. And it gives you a value of longevity that can be um, uh, dated. But, I think it's incorrect because it involves uh, double counting. Remember, I've already said that um, if you extend a person's life, one value that we can recognize separately is all the extra good that she would get in the life, that she gets in the life um, during the uh, extended time that she lives. Um, and that's already taken account of in the, the separable, um, uh, function. I mean, let's let's go back to now. Go back to the two worlds that I've just um, uh, illustrated. These ones, where these people live for two years and die, these people live for four years. We we'll compare those worlds now, but without um, uh, putting the two Ws um, in. Uh, here we have everybody living for two years. Here we have everybody living for four years. And you can see that we get extra value here um, because uh, we've got people living these extra years. In fact, the value in a separable value uh, fashion of, these, um, of, of this um, distribution is 4W in every year measured separately, whereas here it's 2W in every year when we measure it uh, separately. 
So that's already taken account of. And in fact, we can see that this double counting can lead to the wrong conclusion by comparing these worlds here. So I want to compare um, uh, the value of um, uh, worlds where everybody uh, potentially lives for two periods, but in one of them, actually, people die after two periods, they die, whereas in the other world, they do continue to live for the remaining uh, two periods, but their life is miserable uh, during that time. So um, they live for two good years, then they live uh, for two bad years. And I'm now going to set my scale of well-being so that zero of the scale, the zero of W, represents a standard of life which is such that it would be better to die rather than continue living at a well-being of less than uh, uh, zero. So these minuses here, which are levels of well-being in the later periods of these people's lives, these are, are um, levels of life which is such that it would be better for these people had they died earlier after two years. Now, how do we compare these in a separable uh, valuation? Well, do it year by year. Here we get, if we do it simply by addition again, we get 2w minus 2w, which is zero. Here in each year, we get 2w minus half a w. Um, so it's one and a half w. So here each year the value is positive. Here each year the value is uh, zero. So this is on this separable valuation, a better world, but it isn't a better world. For each person, it would be better if she died young, if she dies over here, rather than continue to live in, um, in these conditions of suffering that are imposed uh, on her. Um, so the Hiroshi, the Hiroshi method, I think, um, is not satisfactory. Uh, here's, this says a third idea, but that's because I didn't bother to mention the first one. But this is the next idea that I'm going to be talking about. And that's to say that there's a critical level or a neutral level. Uh, and to say that the existence of a life adds to the value of the world only if the total well-being of that life exceeds the, um, uh, exceeds the total of well-being in uh, the life. So what this, is, what this is saying in effect is that from the point of view of the universe, when it's valuing the world and deciding whether the world is, is good or not, um, each time a person gets born, born into this world, it actually is a bad thing. It's a hit against the value of the world, having a new person. And that hit can only be overcome by having the person live a long enough and good enough life that her total well-being during the life is greater than this negative um, uh, value which her creation brings into the universe. Here is the value function um, uh, for uh, uh, this theory. Um, what we do is we look at each person, here's a person I, and look at her lifetime well-being, which I've got down as WI, and subtract from it the neutral level, N. So this is positive if her lifetime well-being is greater than the neutral level, otherwise it's negative, and then we add up across everybody. So somebody whose life doesn't get up as far as the neutral level is a bad thing. Her existence is a bad thing so far as the universe is concerned. If she gets above the neutral level, it's a uh, good thing. Now this formula recognizes the value of longevity, so long as your life is good, because the longer you go on living, the more W goes up and the more likely it is to get greater than N. And then once it is greater than N, it gets progressively more and more greater than N and adds to the value uh, of the world. So this uh, neutral level theory recognizes the value of longevity, but it's not, at least not simply, um, separable uh, by times. We can get it to be separable by times, if we take these n values, the negative values that I've been talking about, if we take those n values and somehow or other allocate them to times, and if we do that, then we'll be able to count those in a temporally separable um, value function, 
by picking them up at the time that they've been uh, allocated uh, to. And we can do that. So here is a way um, of doing it. We could just allocate the ends, the bad, the bad features of um, uh, the, uh, the existence of a person to the time when a person dies. So each time a person dies, we would just take away the end. And if we did that, we would have managed to get the, 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 this neutral, uh, negative neutral level into the separable function. It will now appear at each time. We will succeed in showing that this world, where people live longer than this world here, is a better uh, world. You can see, look, if you look at each time here, at each time you get a value of 2w minus n. Over here, you get a value of 2w minus n in some years, but in other years, you get a value of 2w. So this is a better world uh, than this one. We can recognize um, the value of longevity in uh, this world um, uh, here, and we can do that without um, separable, violating uh, separability. We won't get into the trouble that Hiro Hirose got into, because we're taking this n away from everybody. Everybody gets an end subtracted from her well-being in the last, at the last time um, that, she, that she lives. This sort of very vaguely represents, um, it, it corresponds to the way that many economists um, uh, do valuations because they um, often think that death is a bad thing that happens to people and they typically assume that death is equally bad for everybody so they subtract it. Um, from people's, um, from the value of the world at the time when people die. It vaguely re resembles economic practice, but only a little bit of work going to it. That's one way of doing it. I actually prefer a different way. I think that, 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 that the better time to locate the badness of the neutral level is at the time of creation, when a person is creating rather than when uh, she dies. And that's because. This then allows us to recognize another value that mostly we intuitively do recognize, which is quite hard to fit into a good value theory. But treating the hit of creation as something that occurs at the time of creation allows us to recognize this. And I'm going to explain what this value is and how we can recognize it. Um, plausibly, um, the creation of a person is something that happens gradually. People don't suddenly spring into existence as fully created people all at an instant. It takes some time to, before uh, a person comes into existence um, after the beginning of the creation uh, process. Um, and once we recognize that, and once we think of this, this neutral level as a hit that should be allocated to the time when a person is created, we can spread that hit over the extended period of the person's creation. And that gives the solution to this other problem of life and death that I mentioned. Intuitively, a lot of people think that the death of an infant um, uh, a very young human being is less bad than the death of a young adult uh, human being. Although both are no doubt bad events, um, if, a, if a very young child dies, a very young baby dies, that's not so bad as the death of somebody, say, a 20-year-old. Whereas naively, you might well think it should be, we should count it as worse because the infant loses an extra 20 years of life that the young adult has, act, has already had. So naively, you might think it should be more bad for a child to die, but many of us think, no, the death of an infant is less bad. Um, how can that be? Well, the answer that I, that I can offer you is that um, an infant is not yet fully a person. A person uh, takes time, and um, we can allocate the negative value of existence, the, the n, we can spread it over the time during which she comes into existence, and you will see what the effect of that is. So suppose that um, uh, there are, in a good long life, there are 
there are four periods, but the first two periods are the, 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 the time over which the person comes, in, comes into existence. Um, so when you are valuing a person who dies in ripe old age, this is how you would do it. During the first two periods, when I'm assuming that her standard of life um, is still W, but she's not completely a person, she's only acquiring personhood during this time, so I'm taking away half of the neutral level during each of those periods. And then she's getting two periods um, of, um, in life uh, after that. So that's what, how things are for a person who owns, um, lives all her life, her full life. This is how things are for a person who dies when she just becomes a person. So she's gone through the creation and now she's a person. This is what she has in her life. And here is a person who dies in infancy before she gets uh, to be a person. Now compare these two. This is going to be worse than this, provided n by two, half of n is greater than uh, w. If this negative value, half the negative value is greater than the well-being that, that happens during this certain period of creation, this is going to come out less good than this. And that is a crude example of my theory of why the death of a young adult is more, uh, is more of a bad thing than the death of an infant. I mean, it just supports my idea that we should think of the, the neutral level as a hit that the universe takes from someone's creation at the time she's created rather than at the time she dies. So what's happened so far? Well, we've found a way to give value to, um, the, to longevity um, and do it in a way that's uh, separable across times. And it also has the merit of answering this other question about the value of life and uh, death. Of course, it's not at all like the common practice of evaluation that economists carry out, but at least it's separable. So it looks as if it might be possible to incorporate this into a theory that allows for some uh, discounting. Uh, I'm not going to try to do that, but it's given a separability uh, at any rate. But I, I think perhaps the most important lesson that I want to draw from what ha what's happened so far is that in order to do separability, which is to say in order to even to make sense of discounting uh, the periods when people's lives and existence are in question, we have to think about the ethics of population. I was using a theory from the ethics of population, uh, neutral, the neutral level uh, theory. That's, that's uh, where this theory uh, comes from. And that is incorporated in the value function in order, to make, um, in order to make it possible to give value to longevity within a separable function. We can't think about discounting, we can't think about separability without thinking about um, population ethics, which immediately makes everything a lot more difficult because population ethics is uh, extremely difficult. But actually, it should have been clear from the beginning to any economist that you can't think about discounting without thinking about population because the standard theory of discounting within economics has a theory of population ethics built into it. Maybe you have noticed that, but and I'm going to explain it uh, in a moment. But the standard Ramsey formula, which is the formula for the discount rate, which is universally applied in economic theory of discounting, the standard Ram Ramsey formula depends on a particular theory of population ethics, and not a terribly plausible one uh, for that matter. Um, uh, and I've al already explained that discounting using the standard um, Ramsey formula can give no value to longevity, but it has this further implication, this further strong implication of a particular theory of population ethics. And I'm just going to show you what that theory is. Here's the Ramsey formula. Now, I, um, as I say, I have no idea who all of you are who I assume is still listening um, to this uh, event. I don't know how many of you might have any familiarity with economics and how many of you don't, 
if you don't like formulae of the sort that they use in economics, I'm afraid this is not going to be very um, nice for you for the next few slides. You might want to turn off your uh, attention. Um, but if you, if you do, I'm giving you the Ramsey formula in a very simple form, and I'll talk about where it can be derived from. Here's the Ramsey formula. This is the formula for the discounting of commodities. It tells you the rate at which the value of future commodities, by that I mean material goods like food and bicycles and things, the rate at which the value of commodities as we look through the future diminishes, the rate at, what, at which we should give less value to future commodities. And the formula tells us that this rate is made up of two components. The first is this thing rho, which stands for what's generally called the pure rate of uh, discount. It's the rate of discount on value itself, how much we discount future value compared with present value. Um, and it's, it's pure. If you, you, if you think you, that there is a positive row, so you attach a positive pure rate, you use a pure, positive pure rate of discount in your formula, that means you think that good things that happen in the future are less valuable than exactly the same good things that happen now. That's what, that's what rho uh, is about. So that's a pure rate of discount. And then there's this um, extra component, which is a product of two things. G is easy. That's the growth rate of consumption per period. So this is, a, this is what you might call an economic um, parameter. This is how fast the economy is growing um, per person. It's not um, the uh, increase in GDP, it's the increase in GDP per person. Um, this uh, uh, eta is something known as the elasticity of value with respect to individual uh, consumption. It, it's, it's a measure of how much somebody's consuming extra goods adds to um, the value of the world. I'm actually in a moment going to assume that the way it adds to the value of the world is by adding to her well-being, and we take account of that in the value of the world. So people consume goods, um, and we're assuming that it's this consumption that makes their, um, their lives worthwhile, and ETA tells you how much increasing your consumption of goods increases um, the value uh, of your life. I should say, not your whole life, the value of your life um, at any particular time. It's how much it increases your temporal well-being, how much increasing your consumption increases your temporal well-being. It's a measure of that. It's called an elasticity. That's just an economist's uh, notion. There's the formula. This is um, uh, a, a, a general value formula from which it can be derived. So um, have a look at this. Uh, v is the value of the world. So this is a value function for the value of the world. Um, it's an integral over time, um, and it's a separable uh, value function, that is, because what you're doing is you're valuing the world at each time, and then you're integrating across time. So you're integrating across time here. And what you're integrating is the value that's assigned to the world at each time. And here that is. Uh, start, over, uh, start over here. That's total consumption, C. This is the number of people. So this fraction is consumption per person. This is per capita consumption here. And V is the value that derives from per capita consumption. So if we assume that everybody is consuming the same, then they will each be consuming um, the per capita consumption. And this V tells you the value that's derived from that, how much good uh, is delivered to the world by people consuming um, uh, this, this amount. So that's what the V is. This is the individual value that there is. Now, this is a crucial thing in the formula. This is then multiplied by N, which is the number of people who are alive at time T. So you take the value of each person and you multiply it by the number of people. So this is the total value uh, in the world, where which is value belonging to each person, multiplied by the number of people. And delta here is a discount factor. Delta 
which we will decline over time in the standard uh, formula, um, is the uh, relative value that you apply to later values compared to uh, earlier values. This is the world valued at each time. And if it's later in time, delta is less, so it gets less value. So we treat the value of later things as less and less um, uh, the later in, in history. Now, this formula, the Ramsey formula, can be derived from this value function. Now, I'm not going to try and do it. Um, there, uh, there is actually a derivation on this page. Um, uh, I'm just telling you, you can derive it that way. And that value function can be thought of as the foundation of the Ramsey formula. The Ramsey formula can be derived from this uh, value function. This is the value function that underlies the Ramsey formula. Now, I haven't proved that. I mean, what I did on the previous page, which you didn't, spend, you didn't look at, is that the Ramsey formula can be derived from this value, value function. I didn't prove that this is the only value function from which the Ramsey formula can be derived. And I haven't done that. Um, I, I should, really, but uh, I haven't. But I'm pretty sure that there's no significantly different value function that will give you the Ramsey formula. And that means that the Ramsey formula embeds the theory that's inside this uh, value function. This value function is the, um, represents the theory of value that's implied by the, the Ramsey formula. And so now we need to ask, how do we make sense of that? How can we understand this value function? Well, I've already made the simplifying assumption implicitly, the simplifying assumption that everybody is consuming the same. That is implicit in here. That's why we, we attach a, a value to consumption per head. Everybody is consuming consumption per, per head. Um, and I've also actually mentioned that I'm going to assume that this is each person's well being. So, what we're valuing is the well being that people have at each time, which they derive from consuming consumption uh, at each time. Um, so those, those are a couple of simplifying assumptions. Let's make those. And given that, let's see how we can make, um, uh, make sense of that uh, formula. For, for the moment, um, ignore the delta. Um, so we'll not try doing any um, pure uh, discounting um, on it. So look at this formula without the delta. Suppose that's just one. And what, what is this formula? Well, it says, so what you do is you look at everybody's well-being at a time. Um, you take the total of people's well-beings at that time um, uh, by taking each person's well-being and multiplying by the number of people, and then you add up across times. So it's saying we're taking the total of well-beings at every time and adding those across time. And that is, um, that function is what can be called uh, total complete utilitarianism. It's total utilitarianism because it's adding up across everybody's lifetime well-being. But as well as that, it's assuming that each person's lifetime well-being is the total of the well-being that she has during her life. So to get the value, you first of all add up across lives, or you can do it this way. You add up across lives and then you add up across people. Each life is simply the total of well-being, has, has a value that's simply the total of well-being world has a value which is simply the total of everybody's um, uh, um, lifetime well-being. So that's the theory. It's total complete utilitarianism. Now there are severe objections to total complete uh, utilitarianism. In fact, they all, all the ones I know of, stem from the one that I've been talking about up to now. It's the assumption of separability uh, at times. Um, the separability of times prevents us, done, done in, a, in a crude way rather than the subtle ways that I described later, it prevents us from making any distinction in value between adding well-being to the world given, put into the life of somebody who we've already got and adding well-being to the world by adding a new person. I said very early on that most of us intuitively think that if well-being is a good thing, that well-being is a good thing and furthermore it's better to have well-being added into a, a life we've already got rather than to have a new person uh, living uh, that life. 
Um, so it's ruling out the neutral level theory that I've uh, uh, just described because neutral level theory does give value to creating uh, more value to extending a life than to creating a, a, a new life. It also, incidentally, for any of you who are economists, it rules out average utilitarianism, which is implicitly at least very popular in economics. So total complete utilitarianism is at the very least a controversial uh, theory, but it's implicit in the standard theory of discounting in uh, economics. If we put the discount factor back, we get a discounted version of total complete uh, utilitarianism, which adds some further doubts that we can um, take against it. So here's the conclusion that I want to draw. But even before we think, start thinking about discount rates, we have to think seriously about the ethics of population, which is difficult. And indeed, our standard theory of discounting within economics is committed to one particular theory of population ethics, which I, I have to say, um, uh, I suspect Ramsey arrived at without really thinking very much about it. Um, so it's a theory that, that economists find themselves committed to without really having applied the thought that they, that they uh, need to. And other theories are not even consistent with theories of, po of population ethics, are not even consistent with discounting as it's uh, usually done. So discounting and population ethics do not sit well together, and at least you have to think about population, think about population ethics if you want to do discounting. And that's the end. <laughs>